There was one last contract I had. And over the last few years, he has become very popular and very well known on TikTok. My guest today joining me for episode 163 is trainer Jennings the third. You know, when I think about overcoming obstacles and adversity in life, this man that I get to talk to you today uh, is at the top of that list. Uh, We will discuss in detail today, uh, and you will see exactly what I mean uh, from where he was to where he is now. Uh, Trainer is the founder of Let My Wife Sell Your Home, the founder of Believe in Your Spouse, and most recently at the beginning of 2024, he founded Believe in 901. He is also a senior leader and earned equity shareholder in Amari Global. Trainer and his wife, Jessica, co-founded T&J Group, which is the rental property company. He is originally from Hernando, Mississippi, now resides in Memphis, Tennessee. Welcome to the show, Trainer. You obviously do your homework. <laughs> Glad you to know, be here. My pleasure. You know, in around September of 2022, uh, shortly after I'd interviewed Mark Goodfellow, on my podcast, this guy named trainer Jennings, who I've never met before in my life, reaches out to me on Facebook, sends me a friend request. And so normally like, if it's a guy sending you a friend request, you're like, okay, I better have a lot of guys in common with this guy. So you you look at it a little bit weird. Yeah, just kidding. And, um, I saw we had many friends in common, so I accepted it. And I'm extremely glad that I did on many levels. Uh, now a year and a half late, one and a half years later, Uh, I get to bring them on my podcast today. And as we talk today, you'll understand why. You know, I mentioned originally from Hernando, uh, you went to school, what was then called SBC is now called North Point Christian School in South Haven. Uh, You were an extremely successful student trainer with the honor of finishing dead last in the class of 2000. True story. Um, The truth is that when you were younger, uh, you had a learning disability. You know, tell us a little bit about that and uh, how you were able to overcome that obstacle in your life. It was, school was very hard for me. I actually tried, uh, I did graduate last in my class with a 1.9 GPA and I just had a, I had trouble remembering what I just read. And even if I read it two, three, four times, which I was instructed to do, it just really didn't click with me. And I hated school. Uh, like there's a, some people that were like, man, I wish I could go back to school. I, I hated it. Me too. Um, I like the, the kids and uh, sometimes my teacher and I got along and, you know, I had some students like my uh, second grade teacher that they really knew how to, to teach me. Uh, you know, not every teacher I had knew how to knew how to make it click for me, but I did have certain teachers that really sat down with me and just spent more time with me and was really there for me. And, and again, Miss Busby was one of those, uh, my second grade teacher, she's 95 now. And, uh, but yeah, school was very hard for me. I was actually in reach class or uh, I guess you call it special ed. Um, but yeah, I was in there where I had, you know, uh, more time and i'll tell you I, I i used to feel you know when i saw kids go by and and be in the other classrooms you know i guess the regular learning and i was in there i kind of just i did I, I i felt a little different you know um because i was in a classroom of four or five people versus a classroom of 25 to 30 but yeah i i, I truly needed it i needed that extra learning and uh it was hard you know speaking of gladys busby um you just took her recently to the peabody capriccio grill for her 95th birthday you just mentioned you know what impact did she have on your life and and you had to have talked about it when you had lunch with her yeah so again she i spent some recesses uh in and her in the room and she was always uh teaching me uh she went above and beyond trying to get me to understand what was going on in the classroom. And I had one of my most successful years as a student under under her being my teacher, under her leadership. 
And I just remember, you know, she was always an encourager, always, always an encourager and just made me feel important, even though, you know, maybe, and still I, I, I made decent grades, you know, while her, while her being my teacher, but um, again, she just made me feel important. And so therefore, when she turned 95, I wanted to make her feel important. I picked her up in the convertible and, you know, got her to be the honorary duck master for the Peabody, took her to lunch. And again, I made her feel important that day because she that entire 180 days of me being in her classroom, she always made me feel important. She made everybody feel important. Right. She does not look 95, by the way. No. Not at all. I mean, not I never, all. never would have guessed that. I would have thought 75. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, ah, but then there was college. You went to Ole Miss to study business management, a campus where there's never a party or any good bars to go to, uh, no good golf courses anywhere around, and all the girls there are quote unquote hypothetically unattractive. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that's when you hit the books and things turned around for you, right? <laughs> Yeah, I did not take school serious. And, you know, they I'll tell you this, they actually have a disabilities program to where I actually had a note taker uh, that Ole Miss paid for and hired to take notes for me uh, when I went to class. But even that wasn't enough for me. Um, I just could not, I just couldn't concentrate. And I just found out, you know, when you, when you move away, you know, there's a lot of distractions and every single distraction uh, I I was in front of. And, you know, again, I wouldn't I wouldn't change anything uh, only because it my whole life I had to think outside the box. And, you know, um, and it just it really helped me get my janitor business started, actually, when I when I launched it. But because uh, Oxford was one of my first uh, contracts that that area uh, was one of my first contracts. So, but again, yes, I, I definitely was not a student of the books. That's for sure. And, and you picked Oxford, Mississippi, which is just amazing down there on many different levels to try to, you know, not fix what was broken, but that's a hard place to uh, concentrate without yeah. having any issues yeah um if if to all parents out there you know i, I love Ole miss but hey if, if you think your 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 son or daughter has an issue with uh concentrating or staying focused uh, i would not send them to uh Ole miss <laughs> <laughs> i very much agree with that you know even with all the distractions uh in, in, in your life um which one we'll talk about today, you were still very entrepreneurial. Uh, as you just mentioned, uh, you and your partner started a commercial cleaning business in uh, April of 2007. How did you get started, you know, in Oxford? I guess maybe you started a little bit earlier in Oxford before you came to Memphis. And what did you like most and least about that business? Well, I actually started it in 2006 with two partners and um, our fourth contract was the Gold Strike Casino, and it was, and, I, and I'll tell you how we got that. That was a crazy, crazy deal. So I went down there and put a brochure under the, I found out at the Gold Strike where their janitor, you know, door is or where they, where they put all their supplies. And I just put a, I put a, I put a really nice portfolio together and put it under there. And like two days later, I'm getting a goal strike or a call from this like 662 number. And I was like, oh my word, like that might be the goal. And it was. And they brought us in and they were like, you know, or no, you were like, hey, can we, you know, we'd like to interview you. You're local. Yeah, we're local. The company they were using was not local. They were, they were a massive company. I think they were a global company. And so we had just started, we weren't even open for just a few months. And, uh, and so when they brought us in to, uh, have an interview, you know, I think we, we did great. And, and then they were like, well, we're going to give you the contract. And it was a substantial, I mean, it was seven days a week, 
we cleaned all six kitchens, the front and back of the house. I think the back of the house was just as large as the front of the house. It was a massive contract. And so they brought in, they flew like four people in from Vegas. They had like 40 people in the meeting when we were about to get the keys to start cleaning it because they had the, I mean, it's a big deal. Like, yeah. you know, we're around money, you know, we're around all kinds of stuff. Right. And, uh, and so, yeah, that was, that was, and then, uh, and then about a year later, I branched off and started on my own. Uh, and, and the first contract I had when I started my own company was the Tad Smith Coliseum. And I think I charged them $25,000 or something like that to uh, clean the Tad Smith and getting, and, and I, I was getting it ready for graduation and some of the people that I was going to be graduating with was actually going to be graduating at the Tasmith Coliseum that we just cleaned and from there uh, we got a lot of uh, so I'll, Ole Miss started hiring us to do a lot of cleaning there during the summertime and then I just started getting school districts after that I got uh, Lafayette County Schools, Senatobia City Schools, a lot of DeSoto County Schools and so I was really just concentrating on schools after that. How many employees did you guys have? Between 60 to 70. And most of those, you know, so it was, yeah, it, it was, it was probably, it was around six. Yeah. I mean, we had all the schools in Lafayette County. We had the whole entire school district, Senatobia city school district. We had a lot of DeSoto County schools. So you're driving around, not only cleaning yourself, I'm sure knowing you, you're also overseeing everything and making sure they're doing their job. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and yeah, we, we were in, in a 60 mile radius. So, uh, and then, then that opened up to some county in Georgia wanted us to come in and, and I, I flew there to, to even start cleaning there, which we never did. And there, and there was a couple of reasons why, but they would have, I feel like they would have absolutely hired us to clean their school district uh, because I did have a lot of great recommendations from the superintendents. Right. That one little brochure underneath the janitor's door. It's amazing how that got started. Yeah. That yeah. Is definitely thinking outside of the box, you know, yeah. there are many different kinds of addictions that, you know, they can be detrimental to one's health physically, mentally, and emotionally. Uh, you know, you've been really open uh, about yours. Um, and I will know a huge one for you. You bring it up a lot because you want to help other people. Um, you said, quote, alcohol and gambling equals bad people. I am a changed man, unquote. You know, you've been sober now coming up on 15 years this November 1st. Uh, tell us about, you know, when this started for you, uh, when you felt that you were at, quote, unquote, rock bottom and uh when you decided to completely it was time to change my life so when i when i when i hear when i hear so when i was in the cleaning business i never i, I felt i was just making so much money at the time that i didn't think i could ever lose it all and and I might have had an ego about me that you know hey I just I'm not I'm not gonna I can't I can't lose this and I had people come to me and say hey man I've had a whole lot of money and I've lost a lot of money and you know you know I lost it by the way you're acting and I was like oh no man I'm good but and I just kept losing one contract after the other and I'll tell you why I lost them. I lost, I lost the, I lost the, the, the contracts because I was gambling. I was gambling my payroll. I was gambling. Um, yeah, I was gambling my payroll. And, and even though alcohol had a play, a, a big major factor in that, that, you know, you don't think you're best when you're drinking alcohol, but really and truly I was a functioning alcoholic to say the least. I mean, I was going to bed at one in the morning and getting up at seven and taking care of business. So I really was taking care of business, right? But, 
you know, when you're gambling and you're gambling, you know, and you can't keep up and you're gambling your profit, and you're just, you just keep doing that. It's going to catch up to you at some point. And that's exactly what happened to me. And I hit my, I, I, there was one last contract I had, maybe it was, uh, 20, 25, 25,000 a month or something. I can't remember. It was something close to that. It was a school district. I had one left and, uh, and I lost it and I had to move out of my home, uh, had my cars taken away. Uh, and I had nothing, man. I had absolutely nothing. And, you know, two cars repossessed. I'll never, you know, I'll never forget the feeling when I see, you know, a, a tow truck coming and, and coming to get it. And this one guy, I'm like, Hey man, you know, I just had my, my, my Corvette repossessed and I had one car left. It was a, Denali and I'm like man this is embarrassing can you just can we just drive it down a couple miles I was like I, I promise you I'll give you the truck I'm not gonna drive away you know I just don't want you to do it in front of my home and uh and so yeah I did it and so yeah I moved in with one of my my best friends and um I had to borrow my dad's car and uh, at one point I was paying for 18 cell phones for my business and uh and so since it was in my name, I couldn't even go just get one phone because I owed for like 18. And um, so I had to borrow my dad's phone and his car. And uh, and going back to that day when I had lost everything, you know, when I had moving my buddy, man, I didn't want to be here anymore, to, to, to be very honest. Um, you know, I was kind of planning my escape. You know, and that's, uh, I don't, I've really never told anybody that, but yeah, I didn't, I did not want to be on earth anymore. I had, I had, uh, done a lot of people wrong and I just couldn't face reality anymore. And, uh, and that day when I was just like, man, I just don't want to be here. My dad came over and, uh, he knocked, I was staying at my friend's house and he, uh, knocked on my door and I, I wouldn't answer it and finally he's like you better open this door like and he looked like he was about my dad looked like he was about to come through the door if i didn't and i answered it and he came in and i was all disheveled and he's like look you know you know how to make money you know you just don't know how to keep it if i send you to get help will you go and i was like dad i remember i'll do anything and i did Good. And uh, three days later, uh, I was going to Cumberland Heights in Nashville, Tennessee. I had my mom, my dad, and my sister in the car, and they were they were dropping me off at rehab for for 30 days. So, um, you know, yeah. And l this sounds really crazy for someone to understand, but my ego was so bad when I was when I was you know, driving fancy cars. I had people drive me. I had, I, I met one guy the other day in an Uber that he used to be one of my drivers. So I had people that drove me around. Uh, I guess you call him a chauffeur. I mean, I, I, it, I was living a crazy lifestyle, but you know, I didn't want to be seen in, in a car unless it was a very, you know, unless it was an expensive car. I didn't want to be seen in it. So I always wanted to have my car at all times have, you know, and I could just have people drive me and drive us around if I wanted to. Like I was, I had a sickness, not just the alcohol, but just who I was as a person. You know, I was, I was really bad off. And uh, yeah, so yeah, we, we went to rehab. And after that, uh, I lived in a, uh, so after 30 days in rehab, I'm like, I'm ready to go. I'm a changed man. I'm going to start my company back. And the, 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 you know, they were like, no, 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 no. You know, Cumberland Heights is like, no, no, no. You, you need more help. I was like, no, I'm, I'm fixed. I don't want to drink. I'm good to go. And they were like, look, dude, I hear this story all the time, man. You need, you need more help. And they were right. So I went to Dallas, Texas and lived in a sober house for one year signed in signed out when we left i rode public transportation the bus and the train started working for minimum wage at west elm furniture and i'll say this i was going to work at a sunglass company 
and they were they did a credit check and i guess i didn't pass the credit score so i didn't get the job like it was actually really hard for me to find a job because right. uh, then they were like well tell me about your past and i didn't tell them anything about the alcohol but i was like i listed all these accomplishments that i had and they're probably wondering you know like why am i gonna come right. work for them so my therapist was like look man just just tell them that you were just new here to town like you know you can't tell them all that because they won't ever hire you they'll think you're you're crazy why would you want to work for minimum wage so yeah my first job shout out to west town furniture for hiring me uh for, for minimum wage you know i talk a lot about the power of a moment and you know when you have the suicidal thoughts like you were talking about you know i've had them too um most recently, five years ago, I came real close. Um, I still don't know if I would have swallowed that bottle of pills the two different times, but sitting in the room with my dogs and bawling, crying, I, I, I say that they saved my life. But the power of a moment, your dad coming over that day, that was supposed to happen. 100%. I mean, there's no doubt that was supposed to happen because who knows, you know, what would have happened had you him not not only coming over but being persistent as heck to say you open that dang door yeah so you know obviously kudos to jim for that that's awesome um years ago i read a book how to win friends and influence people by dale carnegie uh, it was a great book i still highly recommend it to anyone who wants to improve themselves you actually studied uh at the dale carnegie uh training institute in 2009 graduated in 2010 um, why did you do that? And what were some of the important things you learned about uh, life and uh, most importantly yourself while you were taking that course? That is a great question. So when I, my uncle, Uncle Johnny, he, uh, he owned the Dale Carnegie franchise in Dallas. And so when I was living in the half sober house, halfway house, whatever you want to call it, um, he said, hey, I want to get you in i'll give you a scholarship and you can take this class for me okay so at the time i probably had a couple months sober and and this is in 2009 and he said and so he, he gave me a scholarship so when i was in there i i that really is what helped me that was one of the key parts in all my sobriety so you have to you have to when you take that class you got to get up in front of people and share your story and talk you know be vulnerable with people right and and a lot of times in aa i mean you hear people that you know you compare trauma a lot of times in aa you compare trauma you're like man i don't want to share my story because somebody else just you know they just lost somebody or they did something really stupid you know, I don't want to share my I don't want to share my story in my A meeting because I mean it's not near what those are. So, so that being said, um, I really got comfortable in sharing my story and in those rooms of Dale Carnegie, and and I was able to share, you know, where I was, what I had been through, and I I can't remember if I got a standing ovation, but I definitely had tears in people's eyes in class as I was sharing my story. And I was like, wow, you know, I really touched a lot of people here because everyone has pe people, every family has an alcoholic or an addict or some type, sure. every family. And thankfully now that more and more people are starting to talk about it, you know, because I think that's what helps a lot of people nowadays, you know, get over it more is to be able to talk about it. A lot of people didn't want to talk about it. Absolutely. So yeah, that right there helped me be, start to share my story that I could tell anybody. When did you come back to Memphis? Probably in around 2012, 2000, yeah, 2011 or 2000, yeah, I think it was 2012. So I lived in a sober house for a year from August, 2009 to August or, of 2010. And then I got an apartment for right at two years. So maybe it was it was probably like August of 2012. What made you come back? Well, I had started working at a leather business 
and uh, my clients were, I had a lot of clients all over the country, but some of them were FedEx and AutoZone, Smith & Nephew, Medtronic, and I had a lot of, I did a lot of business at FedEx. And so, you know, if you have FedEx as your customer, sure. uh, they were like our company's biggest client and they were my client. So, um, so yeah, I came back and plus I had a couple years sobriety under my belt and I felt like I was, I was just, I was ready to move back, you know? And, uh, and you know, I'll tell you, I, I'm pretty networked now back. I didn't, all the people that I know now and I hang out with, I did not know them, you know, back when I was really blowing and going in 2007, eight, nine and 10, 2006. Uh, I didn't, I didn't really know any of those people in Memphis. It was all really DeSoto County. Right. It's probably a good thing. Yeah. Cause you know, you, you said you, you did somebody, some people wrong, you know, you obviously in the many things you've done, you've made up for that because everybody goes through their stuff. And just like you said, there's, everybody has some type of addiction in their family, whatever it is, whether it's alcohol, gambling, you know, drugs, food, whatever it is, there is some type of addiction. I'm sure that. Your parents were very proud of you for following through and doing that and then coming back here and you know and, and starting to make things happen again in your life yeah yeah they no, they they look if they lose sleep at night right now it's not because of me so that's a good thing <laughs> Abs absolutely um one of your favorite quotes is quote do good and good will follow you unquote um what does that mean to you and why is it so important in your life so this doc, my doctor from growing up was Mac Baxter, and he would always say that, you know, do good and good will follow you. And, and, and if you really look at it in today's world, it's, it, it's kind of like that, you know, um, you know, if you do good and, and good will follow you. I just think if, but, the, but here's the thing, if you're, if you're doing good, you're putting yourself in good situations. Right. Right. And, and so you want to look at it that way and not just, it's not just luck. I don't, I really, I don't believe in luck at all. Um, but yeah, you put yourself in good situations. Most of the time you're going to come out on top. Yeah. I have a friend that talks about this and he says he's a marketing guru, uh, grew up with him. He lives in Nashville. Um, been very successful and he gives 10% of everything to charity. And he's done this for years and years and years. And he said he does it because he wants to, but you put good out into the world. And like I said, good comes back. And he said, it's definitely true. It's, it's, it's happened for him over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the same thing's happening for you and the things that have happened for you, especially over the last, you know, seven or eight years. You know, I, I, I don't, I, you know, there's a lot of people that say I'm lucky. Uh, like, I, I guess I want to, uh, car i made a hole in one and won a car uh won an audi one year but i just i don't i don't i so i really don't think it's luck it's just i'm i'm so positive like under that over that golf shot like i was just like i'm gonna make this you know and there's a lot of people that have the victim mindset and i'm not one of those i probably used to be one Me too. but that don't that don't make you go very far in life it actually makes you miserable and so I'm, I am so positive that some people are just like, how are you so like, I am so positive that it may be unrealistic at times. Right. But that's just, that's, that's just how I like to be is be positive. It's a good way to be, you know, speaking of golf while at your house, I saw several, you know, golf trophies and plaques. I believe there was an article written about you years ago about your game. Um, what is it that you enjoy? Uh, about golf so much and are you better than Mark Goodfellow at playing golf? Yeah, I, I think I could beat Mark, but he doesn't play. He doesn't, he doesn't, he hadn't really, he hadn't played. He's a really good tennis player. I could not yeah. beat Mark in tennis or pick a ball. Right. Um, but uh, it's just something that I grew up playing as eight years of age. And, you know, I grew up playing around men. I think that's why I'm, I, I can talk to, to men uh, look, I was going on golf trips when I was nine, 10, 11 with, with men, you know, while their kid, their kids were going playing 
T-ball or coach pitch, I was out there with, I knew what a two down press was when I was eight, you know, uh, three down, two down, one and one, oh and two, one and three. Like I was literally gambling with these men and hearing stories about just just growing up with them. And um, it, it, it really helped me. Uh, I think in, later on in, when it comes to business, being able to talk, talk to men. Cause I mean, I had, I was closer to older, I was like nine, 10 years old. I was closer to a 60 year old man than a, one of my eight year old buddies, you know, right. just because I was with them all the time play, playing golf. You know, I, I didn't like to play with kids my age because I mean, I had a few kids that were good, but not not great. I did. Yeah, not great. And so I, right. I my, my golf game was was playing with the men. Right. Did you have an opportunity if you wanted to to play in college or was that not an option? I absolutely could have. Absolutely. Uh, it's just I had a broke collarbone uh, in the 11th grade and I had it. And then I, I kind of had a little and then six months later, or five, maybe four months later, it kind of happened again in the tournament. Kind of just and at that point, you know, I just didn't. It was just, yeah. I mean, a collarbone, you cannot swing a club. And I kind of right. just kind of gave up from there. Right. When did you pick it back up again? So I kind of gave up in the year 2000 and I kind of picked it up in 20, 2012, 2013. I started playing again, you know, when I moved back here. Right. How did it come back to you pretty quickly? I mean, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I could yeah, go I four year, five years and, and it's just, Look, it's, it's like riding a bike for me. Now my short game not be not might not be as great, but yeah, I can always, you know, play play pretty well. That's how it always was for me for tennis. If I went a few years in between and picked up a racket, maybe 15, 20 minutes to get used to it again. But then, you know, I was able to hit the ball. Just you know, I felt like just as well as I used to. So mm -hmm. yeah, I understand that. You know, speaking of Mark Goodfellow, I reached out to him and asked him if he had a few words to say about you for our podcast today. He said, quote, he believes in everything, his spouse, his dog, the police, the mailman, just about everything, unquote. And he told me to make sure to say, ha ha. He didn't say all that, but he said, in all seriously, he told me, quote, trainer is full of life, loves to make people feel important, loves to help, he's visionary, he beats to his own drum, he's unique, passionate giving and he's definitely different in a good way unquote you know you guys obviously have a unique friendship tell us about the, the mark good fellow that you know well i want to tell you how i met him so i think i friended him on facebook in like 2012 and uh doug brown the, the general manager the president of the peabody uh, he used to sit on the bench at the tigers games and and doug would uh, invite me quite frequently and like we literally sat right next to the Gatorade stand at Memphis Tigers games and and Mark sat like right behind us like first row and and so he would and so I, I just I, I went to China in 20 or 12 or 20 maybe 2013 and I put it on Facebook and again, Mark and I had never met before that point, right? But I think right. like everybody, like, oh, I want to follow Mark. You know, everybody asked sure. Mark to be a friend on Facebook. Right. And so Mark said, oh, how was China? And I turned around and I was like, oh man, I guess he's 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 paying attention. And uh, and then after that, you know, we we uh, we became friends. And and so I'll tell you. Mark has Mark has the biggest heart of anybody I know, and the, and and you know you see him on the commercials and you're like you know he's got the you know he's talking about he's rapping about selling cars and all that but man what people don't know is it's nothing for him to go buy 30 40 50 bikes and give them away and no one would ever know he did it um, he does or or go buy pizzas. You know, a whole, you know, I don't know if it's 20, 40, 50 pizzas at a time and feed a school. Like, and I'm just hitting on two things. Sure. Um, 
you know, when we donated a, you know, a, a, a trip to, to London, you know, uh, you know, he's like a thousand bucks, you know, like no questions asked. Like he just wants to, you know, he's like, I want to do it. So he is always, again, he is definitely the most giving person that I've ever met in my, my entire life. I mean, to give the people that he truly has never known in his life and just someone, someone may go to him and says, Hey man, this person needs help. And he's like, here, here you go. Yeah. You know, I was completely and utterly shocked when I interviewed him on my podcast in late August, early September of 22. And, um, I was not expecting, you know, the emotional and the tearing up and that just like you talked about, I was, you know, cause all I'd known of him is what I'd seen on TV and what I'd seen at a grizzly or tiger game watching TV. And I knew a lot of people that knew him, but I didn't know him. And so the first time I ever talked to him was on my podcast. And when I got done, I was like, completely like that is completely not the guy that I was expecting in a, in a positive way. Not that he's, he's an amazing marketer. Probably you and I would probably say probably the best there is. And, but just completely, it, it blew me away. It blew me away. How passionate was, he, how much that man loved his mother. Um, and how, how broken hearted he was when she passed away and, and just, just, just a wonderful guy. So, uh, I, you ended up, uh, through you and everything and inviting me to the party and everything is how I ended up meeting him. So, you know, that all worked out the way it was supposed to work out. Um, and like I said, we met because of coming to that Christmas party, uh, at your home is December of 2022. Uh, so many people there that I knew, uh, and you and Jessica made me feel very welcome. Y'all, I believe we're still working on your house or just gotten it, you know, finishing touches on remodeling your home. Uh, but that night wasn't about any of us. And you just mentioned a second ago, it was about a, a special little girl named London uh, that you had met. London, I believe her mom, Kristen, and grandmother, Dorothy, all came to this party and they had no idea what was in store for them. Uh, this is an amazing story about heart and giving, and I'd love for you to share it with everyone of how it started and how you put this together for them. So I was actually at lunch with my mom and Mark Goodfellow, and I see this beautiful girl walk by me, and she had like a backpack purse on, and she just caught the corner of my eye, and it was London. I think she was maybe nine. I didn't know how old she, I just saw her walk by and she had a purse and I saw her, her mom and grandma and I pop up and, and I just walk over and I'm like, Hey, you need, you need some money in that purse. And, and so we started talking and this, this girl had, uh, you know, London earrings and I found out she has down syndrome, but it's really hard to tell with her because it was just it was just very hard sure so she had yeah london earrings and I, I gave her i gave her some some money to put in the purse and i probably caught her parents off guard because completely or her, her mom and her grandmother and and so then they were hey her her daughter here her name is london her dream is to go to london you know and she's got london earrings on and i was like I didn't even, I was like, man, that's, I hope she makes it there one day. And I said, Hey, look, you know, Mark and I want to take you shopping for Christmas. It was like September at the time. So it's like, here's my number. Like, I really want to take her. We were really going to take her shopping, you know, when she, for Christmas. And, and so then I go, and then I sat back down and then I was like, man, like, so then I, I, I then I walked out to their car and I just I started praying with her and mom or you know the whole family, you know, and, and I was like, man, God bless this girl, like she's gonna be incredible. She's this girl's got a she's gonna go far in life. Like I could just feel it. And uh so I got her mom's number. Like I think I gave their number, but now I got their number and I started thinking like well maybe we could maybe we could send them to london somehow uh, and and so we 
we did. We uh, got their entire trip. We gave them, I think, a couple thousand dollars in spending money. Like we covered their whole trip, and uh, and yeah. So how I made it happen, um, I called a couple people, and we, my wife and I throw a really big Christmas party every year, and um, and we, you know, we just do it because and, and invite some of our, our our friends, and and we were like. And, and I and I hate asking people for something, right? Like sure. I, if I, I'm not, I'm not in a lot of organizations because um, if I'm gonna do it, I just want to do it myself. Like I'll pay if I want to do something, I'll just pay for it, right? I don't want to. I again, it's just I have a trouble asking people for money. And so I, I called a friend of mine. I was like, look, man, you know, we're gonna have like 140 people at our house. I mean, maybe we could just like throw some money together and make this trip happen. But I, I'm having, I, he's like, dude, you do so much for people. Like you throw an unbelievable Christmas party. He was like, people, it's Christmas. People would love to be part of this. And I was like thinking to myself. And so sure enough, uh, we raised enough money to uh, send London, her mom and her grandmother to London, England for maybe seven or eight days. I can't remember. Maybe I can't. Something like that. And then and then give them spending money. And then this past year, you had them back again in 2023 and showed the video and everything. And I'm looking at um, in my office, the plaque of her over there with a the nice special letter that you guys sent out to everybody that that was part of it and um you were part of it by the way thank you for your donation uh, well my pleasure i didn't have a lot of money at the time but i you know but i gave and you didn't even know me and you asked me yeah, yeah it was funny you're like you need to come early it's gonna be this right i'm thinking to myself honestly when that whole thing it was like i didn't know you and there's so many people that portrayed them and you and i know this on social media people that portray themselves one way that are not really that way and that don't put themselves out there and are not vulnerable like you and i've talked about and i know that you know with what you've shared with me since we've become friends and you've shared some personal things with me and vice versa that i know that this is the genuine you this is the genuine jessica who you know i had your wife on before you about a year ago and um y'all are getting everything's happening for you in such a positive way because of what you do and and what you give and so that was just an amazing thing to do for that family and watching that video and the tears and in the room and it was it was just an unbelievable experience so thank you for having uh me be a part of that because uh those kind of little things are so important yeah hey i invited you because i could tell you're good people so it's thank not Oh, and vice versa. Yeah. Um, what motivates you most every day? And I just, uh, You know, I'm married to a woman that uh, obviously believes in me and, and loves me and I'm surrounded by some really good people. I'm very fortunate. I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to have so many people in my life that 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 love me unconditionally. And um, I just want to I was I just want to do good in the world. You know, um, look, when you've lost when you've had it all and you lost everything and you, you're living in, in a sober home with 19 other addicts uh you'll you'll be changed forever and uh and so i just i love i love helping people you know whether it's my wife's real estate business you know helping you know get her name out there um and just tell other people how great she is because she really is you know um she it's hard to get your it's hard to get real estate agents to answer their phone on memorial day and like she's she's out there 
you know, on Memorial Day, uh, the, the weekend, you know, doing deals and, you know, just just helping people. So it's a lot easier being married to someone like her also to get up and want to, you know, just because that's the way that's the way she is. So um, what gets me up in the morning, you know, what I'm just motive, I'm just motivated to be here, you know, because I remember what it was like when I was before and I was miserable and I didn't want to be here. And now I'm sober. Like you said, I had 15 years in November, 15 years sober in November, and I've got a, a dog and a fence in the backyard and uh, beautiful home, beautiful home. Yeah. So, and an alarm system that talks to you. Yeah, we have 24 cameras. <laughs> yes. You are being recorded. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, rock bottom. You know, I I can't say that. I, I thought I was at rock bottom, but I wasn't. Rock bottom would have been homeless. Rock bottom would have been, you know, not having anybody there for me. You know, I shared the story with some people, some ways and some another, but the truth of the matter is um, this July will be five years um, since I had to close my store, Sleepy Z's Mattresses, out in Bartlett. And I moved home with my mom. And I tell a lot of people I moved home with my mom to help take care of her because she's older, and that's true. But I moved home with my mom also mainly because I had to, um, you know. And a lot of it is after I got sick and had the pulmonary embolisms and was, you know, suicidal and all that. I just sort of lost everything. I lost interest in my business. And when you lose it, it's like you said you lost contracts. I didn't show up at my store, but probably five times in a year. And you know, employees. You know they're not going to do as well and the business went down and it just suffered from it so it's my responsibility but i was stuck and um but going back here to where i grew up in the same home um starting my podcast uh, meeting the people that i've met and then starting this new business has completely changed my life but i had to go through what i went through and failure many times over Filing bankruptcy years ago, watching my Mustang convertible be in towed away. We talk about that in, in front of a bunch of people at an apartment complex at Hunter, the old Hunter's Trace, and how embarrassing it was. And having to share a car, move back home with my dad um, and mom, and share my dad's car. And it, it sucked. And I used to play the victim. Poor me. But it's bullshit. Yeah. It's like you said today, we're not people make choices and people make decisions and I've made a lot of bad ones, but I've also made a lot of good ones and I've had a lot of successes and I've had a lot of failures. just like you and uh, people forget that Kentucky fried chicken, you know, Colonel Sanders, it was in his mid sixties before, you know, he finally got that to work. So I you know, we both will agree that, you know, you put your mind to something and you have enough determination and tenacity, you can do whatever the heck you want to do. You know, I knew this was going to happen, that you and I would have a lot of talk about, that I have so many more things to talk about and get to, uh, that we're going to have to do a part two. So I'd love for you to come back sometime here in the next few weeks and come back on and do part two, because much, much more to talk about, including uh, your wife and, you know, believe in your spouse and your involvement in the police and everything else. So I'd love for you to come back on for part two. Awesome. Well, hey, I'd be, I'd be happy to. I re- and hey, I- I'm glad how much this this took off and you know people there's a lot of people that are like oh, I want to start a podcast and I've never I've never started a podcast because I can just tell how, how hard it is and how consistent you have to be and a lot of people a question for you Mike uh, you know what's the average on on people doing podcasts most people quit before they hit their sixth episode okay all right yeah Yeah. and you know it it just takes time to build no no matter doing what though right like we all want instant gratification no matter what we do in life and you know you've just been i'm telling you asked some of the most amazing questions oh my word thank you you're good thank you i appreciate that very much that means everything to me um 
I want to make sure that I thank our two sponsors, uh, Buckley's Grill. Uh, it's co-owned by Jeff Furinelli and Ken Dick. It's at Poplar in the State, specialized in the most amazing fillets, have the best cream spinach I've ever had in my entire life. Everybody there is so welcoming when you walk in the door. Everybody that waits on you takes really good care of you. So if you've never been there or if you've been there, continue to go back because the food is excellent. And then also uh, Sleep Easy's Masonry, uh, where you rest easy while we're on the job. We do brick, stonework, cinder block. If you need one brick replaced all the way up to the full house being replaced with stone or brick, we will definitely take care of you. It doesn't matter if it's a small or big job, we will do it all for you. Um, how can people follow you or find you on TikTok and Instagram? Yeah, uh, Believe in Your Spouse. So believeinyourspouse.com or we have all four channels, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Believe in Your Spouse. So Believe in Your Spouse. Yep. Awesome. Uh, you know, you're definitely a super talented person. Like I said, full of giving and very, uh, you enjoy life to the fullest. And, you know, and, and it, you have such a big heart. Um, and we have to talk about your genius involvement in marketing and promoting of your wife's business. Now, you know, you know, as, as good as your wife is, she was going to be successful, but the two of you combined together as a team and what y'all do, I, I know it's, it's taken it to a whole nother level. Uh, and definitely want to talk about your work because I have a, like you do, a big passion. I did a lot with the police when I had my mattress store and, and that means to, a ton to me and I see everything that you're doing with the police and it's just wonderful. So we'll have a lot to talk about in part two and I'm so glad you came on today. So thanks again, buddy. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Michael. All right. Talk See to you ya. soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.